Welcome to the Property Buyer Podcast, where we explore the world of residential and commercial real estate to help you make better decisions about buying, selling, or investing in all types of property. Join me, Rich Harvey, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au and multi-award winning buyer's advocate. Our podcast features expert interviews, market trends and insights, and practical tips for navigating the complex world of Australian real estate. Whether you're a home buyer, a seasoned property investor, commercial buyer, developer, or simply curious about the property market, our podcast is for you. Join us as we share our knowledge, strategies, and experience and help you achieve your property goals. Welcome to our next edition of the Property Buyer Podcast. The last interest rate rise was November 2023, when the RBA raised the cash rate to 4.35%. Recent inflation figures have been quite slow at coming down and prompting lots of conjecture from economists about whether the RBA will raise rates one more time to kill off inflation. Cost of living is really biting into household budgets and economic growth is quite constrained. But the housing market appears to be running at a different speed in various locations. Today, we're privileged to have Louis Christopher, Managing Director of SQM Research, to help take the current pulse of the property market and see which parts of the country are rising or falling and where it's all headed in 2025. Now, Louis Christopher is one of the most accurate property forecasters I know, and he produces an annual boom and bust report, which provides excellent insights into the future of the property market across Australia. Now, in today's podcast, we'll be discussing the real impact of interest rate rises, how to fix the housing crisis, predictions for 2025, listing volumes, the upcoming spring season, and when the next property boom will come. (laughs) That's a lot, Louis, but welcome to have, well, great to have you and welcome to the podcast. Nice to be with you once again, Rich. Now, Louis, we have a a little tradition on our podcast, which I did rope you into last year. We have a thought of the week, which I'd love your reaction to. And this is a quote by Steve Jobs. And he says, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. What do you take from that? Well, I couldn't agree with it more. Uh, And I think most business owners would have to agree with that. I would only add to it uh, that as a business owner or indeed if you're an employee, you are there to fulfil a need in society, Mm. in the community. Mm. So either way, we're still responsible and still reportable to the community, whether Mm. you're a business owner or an employee, there Mm. are responsibilities Mm. there. Mm. And you cannot escape that. Love it, yeah. I think it's also saying, don't try to live vicariously. You know, I think it's all about expectations. We all have expectations put on us. And I think at the end of the day, you've got to have good balance in your life, have some fun, work hard, enjoy life as well, so. 100%, we're only here once. Exactly. Well, Louis, let's get stuck into it. I want to talk about the impact of interest rates on property prices, but we've seen consumer confidence being really low. If you look at the Melbourne Westpac Institute, it's been bumping around about 83 points the last, you know, more than 12 months, I believe. Yes. But what do you believe this, this impact of this higher rates over the last 12 months has really had on the property market? Mm, I, I think overall, it's been a dampener on the housing market in 2024. I think we need to wind ourselves back to the beginning of the year where you may recall there was a there was great expectation out there that we we're about to have an interest rate cut. Mm. Well, it never came. Mm. Um, and so the fact that it never came increased the uncertainty out there mm. with buyers as well as sellers. Uh, and I think this has been the number one impact on, in terms of interest rates where they are. Obviously, um, the interest rate levels are at a point where it's been taking out discretionary expenditure out of the economy. Mm. We're seeing that in, for example, in softening retail sales. Mm. Uh, So interest rate settings are doing their job. There is still a risk Mm. out there as we speak right now that the RBA will lift rates again. Mm. When do the next uh, figures come out? Is it in a couple of weeks time or this week? Uh, Next meeting is in August. Mm. And the CPI numbers, the next CPI numbers, which I think maybe you guys are referring about. to, yes. comes out next week. Next week, okay. Because that'll yeah, be... That's, I think it's a Wednesday. A Wednesday, because yeah. that'll be talked about all over the media. That's what that's, everybody's going to watch. Everyone's hinging their bets on, you know. That's right. And if that's a bad number, yeah. there'll be a lot of pressure on the RBA to lift rates in August. Yeah, you're right about the beginning of the year, though. We noticed when we came back in 
late January, early February, there was this renewed confidence that 2024 was going to be a potential rate cut and everyone's going gearing up, let's get into the market. And then it yep. was like, put the brakes on everyone, oh, let's just hold the horses here. That, that, that's exactly right. Uh, and I think that confidence in itself uh, would have concerned the Reserve Bank in terms of cutting rates too soon. Mm -hmm. They were still in the process, and they still are in the process of attempting to slow the economy down to get inflation under control. Mm. So it seems like it's taken a long time for these rate hikes to completely, as you say, dampen demand and wash through the, the, the cycle. Mm. Um, how long does it take for each rate rise to have its full effect? Is it, is it a six month process, a 12 month process? What, do you, what have you seen? Uh, I believe there's no hard and fast rule. Yeah. I mean, overall, it generally does take about between three to 12 months to go through the system. Mm. There's a number of other factors which are in play which can lag the time out. <coughs> lag the time out. Um, mm. For example, one of the things which is uh, very topical at the moment is migration rates. Yep. Mm. And I think one of the reasons why it's taking a little bit longer for interest rates to have their effect mm. in this cycle is because we've had very, very strong population growth. We have. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Yep. But I think the other thing we've seen <coughs> is, is building costs. Um, I saw CoreLogic came out the other day in their Cordell report saying it seems building costs seem to have stabilised a bit. You know, they went crazy. I mean, during COVID, it cost, what, $20,000 for a container ship to come in. You know, yes. crazy. It's the crazy. ABS has been reporting the yeah. same thing as well, mm. that building costs are starting to ease a mm. little. Mm. Um, but it's still, it still has been growing. Mm. And overall housing costs, when you take into account rents, has been having a negative impact upon the CPI. Mm. Prints and will mm. continue to do so for some time to come. So the, the things that make up the, the CPI number, you yep. know, like rents and, and food, and it seems like it's often a perpetual cycle. Like when petrol prices go up and rents go up and it all keeps getting you know, put in the mix, like it's pretty sticky, right, this inflation? It is it's sticky. That's exactly right. It, it runs through the economy and it keeps running through like a recyc recycled air conditioning, mm. <laughs> right? Um, th this, is, this is the issue that the RBA faces. Mm. And at the moment, it's feeding through in the terms of rents, uh, in terms of insurance, education, health, mm. still running through the system. We, the RBA is also being concerned uh, about a, new, a wage inflation spiral, That's it. where how the community responds to these high mm. costs is mm. demand higher wages. Mm. Mm. And if they do receive higher wages, that puts further pressure on the CPI. Yeah. Uh, so they've been avoiding that. And I think, look, they've mm -hmm. had some success in avoiding that. Uh, mm -hmm. Wages growth has picked up, but mm -hmm. it hasn't overly accelerated. Yeah, okay. And what about international events? Like we turn on the news every night and we see the, the poor situation in Israel and Gaza and we see the Ukraine-Russia war and all about the US election. I mean, how do these kind of international events impact the Australian property market, do you think? They can have a, a significant impact. Uh, one of the concerns we had when we put out our last forecast back in November 23 was what would play out in the Middle East. The risk being that if the Middle East really did blow up, uh, you could see things like what we had in the 1970s, mm. uh, where there are restrictions on the oil supply. Oil price shock. Yeah. That, that was the number one concern mm. from our side. And the flow on would have been from that, that you would have seen a big spike in inflation once again. Mm. If you, we were to see a big spike in inflation once again, all the central banks, including our Reserve Bank, would have had to have aggressively lifted interest rates. Mm. Mm. Now, as we know, um, yes, we, we have this regional war in the Middle East, but so far, there's been, some, there's been some periods where I've been very concerned where it looks like it's about to really blow up. But so far, mm. there's been some containment. Whether that continues on, who knows? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because we talk a lot about confidence in this conversation and the property market has got a lot of fundamentals, obviously. We've got supply constraints and demand yes, drivers, do. but there's this overriding thing of, of confidence, right, that really, really helps determine the direction of the market, but doesn't th it? This, this is true, Rich, but uh, I, I'm starting to see this on social media once mm. again, just increased chatter about a potential housing crash in Australia. <laughs> Come on. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Can you highly, knock it on the head, please? <laughs> highly unlikely, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Okay, when we look at history and we look at, for example, the Japanese housing bubble and crash, mm. the US housing crash, the Irish housing crash, yeah. all three of those uh, crashes had one major thing in common, which we do not have in this country, and that was that there was a lot of speculative housing supply 
and construction that occurred mm. just before the crash. Mm. So it was driven by an oversupply situation combined with a fall in demand. Mm. Okay. In this country, I think it's safe to say we do not have an oversupply of housing. <laughs> we, just, we just simply don't. We have got a major undersupply, which has, of course, been the, the, the primary reason why we've got a rental crisis on our hands. Well, that leads me exactly to my next question. Perfect segue there. And, and I want to ask you about what are the current figures for building approvals? Like, has, has this been improving or declining? Where do we sit in sort of the long-term trends? for building Yeah, approvals? It's, uh, it's been declining. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're on track for this current financial year, so FY25, to complete about 138,000 dwellings. The long-term average (coughs) since the beginning of the 21st century um, has been more along the lines of about 160,000 to 170,000 dwellings being built. Um, So we're well under Mm. the long-term average. When I look at approvals, which is about a two-year lead in, uh, from completion, so you have a building approval, give it two years and you've got a completed building, right? Those numbers from building approvals have been trending down. So what this is telling us is that, okay, not only are we going to miss the federal government's target for the first year, uh, where they wanted to build 1.2 million dwellings over five years, mm-hmm. we're going to miss it for year one. Um, we're going to also miss it for year two. Mm-hmm. So the weekly, t- the, mo- the yearly target to hit that 1.2 million dwellings over five years is about 240,000 dwellings. Mm. So you're telling me this federal government target of 240,000 new homes a year is a pipe dream. It's, it's not realistic. It's not going to happen. Okay. Where, so, where they're looking, I think supply will ramp up as we see more social yeah. housing plans mm-hmm. come to fruition. And that might well happen in, say, years, you know, 2027, 2028. Mm. Uh, but they're going to miss their target. The target was 1.2 million dwellings by 2029. And so far, I'd say they're going to be short by at least 100,000. And more than likely now, it's looking like uh, over 200,000. Mm. So what you're telling me is there's basically a structural deficit coming yeah. in the housing supply. And that is no way going to lead to a crash. In fact, it's the absolute opposite. It's going to create more that, problems. That it's going to create more problems. That's not to say we can't have housing price falls. Yes. And we'll, we'll get on sure. to that in a moment, I'm sure. Mm. Mm. Uh, but to say we're going to have an outright crash in the, in the housing market in Australia, yeah. very, very unlikely at this yeah. point in time. Yeah. yeah. I know, look, even in my own experience in dealing with councils, trying to get approvals for, for townhouses, it just, it's a nightmare. It's just... Trying to build anything in this country is very, very difficult. It's very, and something needs to change. Absolutely. Uh, you so, know, it's. Uh, so that's my next question. Like if you were, <laughs> if you're in government, Louis, and you had some power, what what types of policies would you put forward to fix the housing crisis? Would, mm. You've got a green slate. Here we go. You got the okay. whiteboard. Go. For so, it. so what would you do? Rental crisis on our hands right now. The, yeah. the policy which would make the biggest change to stabilise the rental market now uh, would be to cut migration rates. Mm-hmm. for a temporary period. I'm not yep. suggesting for a permanent period, but to cut it back to about 100,000 per annum mm. would do the job in terms of stabilising the rental market within 12 months. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah. That would be the first thing I'd do. But the issue on that, right, if I may just jump in there, <coughs> yeah. the issue on that is simply going to be that that's going to lower economic growth, right? We need migration. We need skilled migrants coming into this country, right? That's the counter argument. We do, we do need skilled migrants coming in, but we do not need it at the rate of growth that we had okay. over the course of 2023, mm. where we had 600,000 people coming in. Mm. That was just too much, yeah. too soon. Mm. Okay, mm. so... It, it, Migration can be used, I think migration can be used as a good economic lever, provided it's used wisely. Mm. And there are times when you, you put on the accelerator, and then there's times where you should be putting on the brakes. Mm. Okay. Um, and so I we, think we've, been, you know, we've, we've, we've had this period following the opening of the borders from COVID, where the accelerator has been put on big time. Mm. And I think it's time that we've applied, that we should be applying the brakes. Okay. Um, so we now, that's, that, so, so that's a temporary thing. Okay, so we drop off 100,000 or so migrants. What else yep. do we do to fix the, the housing okay. crisis? The supply side is critical. Yep. Okay, uh, and with that, I think taxation is a key factor we need to look at. Mm. 
So I'm a great believer in getting rid of stamp duty uh, and replacing it with a land tax, a broad-based land tax. Couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, mm. you, you're actually providing more liquidity to the marketplace. Mm. Yeah. Downsizes can downsize, upsizes can upsize, and the transaction costs are a lot less. Yes. Um, and by having a land tax, that will provide a bit of a, a disincentive for those who do not need to hold, for example, a five bedroom house all on their own. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think that would help significantly. Mm. We've had firm evidence that essentially the stamp duty system we've got from the states has been suffering from essentially bracket creep. Mm. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and with that, we've seen a structural decline in property listings for the last 10 years now in the states of New South Wales, Victoria, and arguably Queensland. Mm. Um, and I think if we were to have this change where we get rid of stamp duty, mm. place it with a land tax, you would see liquidity rise. Mm. And with a rise in liquidity, mm. then there's more choice for buyers, and it should mean that you see more stable prices for all the time. Being. Just to sort of dumb it down to liquidity, you mean it's just going to free up transaction volumes. It's going to, it's basically removing a huge stop and score. If you've got a $2 million transaction, you're going to be spending $90,000. You'll no longer have to spend that 90 odd grand to, to buy that property. A absolutely right. We really appreciate you tuning in to the Property Buyer Podcast and I hope that you're finding our expert interviews helpful. So that we can keep providing this information and growing our audience, we rely on word of mouth recommendations. If you found this information useful, could I please ask you to share this podcast with your friends, family and colleagues and ask them to subscribe to the Property Buyer Podcast. It would be a big help and we'd be very grateful for your support. Thanks once again for sharing the links. And now let's get back to the podcast. So that would be one of the other one one of the taxation um, yep. policies I would bring in. Mm. The other policy I would uh, bring in is is provide more incentives for investors to invest in new homes. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I truly mean investors beyond first home buyers. Mm. Uh, people don't seem to recognise this, but the housing market on the supply side do need investors. The reason is is because developers cannot get the financing unless they've had pre-sales. Exactly. That's the bottom line. Mm. They, nothing is getting, rarely mm. anything gets built on speculation these yep. days. Mm. Uh, so let's encourage investors to, to go into new housing. Mm. Yep. Mm. Uh, I think that would make a change. Now I know the state governments have been working hard to try and free up lo local council restrictions and I think I'll have some success, at least here in the state of New South Wales. Mm. Uh, but I suspect more needs to be done on that mm. front as mm. well. And some hard decisions do need to be made about building high density in inner ring Sydney, inner ring Melbourne, inner ring Brisbane. So to hit the nail on the head, you're talking about zoning here, yep. you know, basically increasing density. I mean, yep. as you say, there's been around 35 suburbs in New South Wales, around Sydney particularly. Yep. We've got Todd, we've got the Transport Orientated Development Scheme yep. within four to 800 metres of a station that yep. you can increase density. But there's a huge nimbyism. There's That's also right. a lot of... Like, look not at, in my backyard. Let's have at, supply, but not in my backyard. <laughs> and look That's at Kiringai right. Council taking out a full-page ad in the Fin Review saying, we do not want development, full stop. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's so. exactly right. Um, yet, yet, I mean, I live in the, in the Kiringai Council area, and the area can have further development, and it needs further Absolutely. development. Mm. Uh, so mm. I, it's, it's really short-sightedness there. Mm. The other thing I think we need to do is consider building up our regional townships. Mm. Uh, and how do we do that? How do we get people to decentralise and move to Orange or Dubbo or whatever? Really good question, uh, Rich. <laughs> I'm not an expert on that front. But Minister, I'll, Minister for Regionalisation, yeah, I can see a new title for you right really, now. <laughs> really, look, it, we, we have difficulty, uh, perhaps taxation incentives yeah, yeah. Uh, might do it. Mm. Um, well, look at teachers and doctors. I mean, I yeah. think there's certain incentives they get to, to go and do locums for a period of time and that Correct. sort of thing. I mean, my brother many years ago, went and worked in Menindi out in yep. Broken Hill for three years. Correct. Know, so. mm. Now, one thing we noticed uh, during COVID, of course, you might be aware of this, is that rental vacancy rates in regional Australia mm. plummeted. Mm. As many people moved out of the cities to get it. away from the lockdowns That's from it. COVID, mm. and they plummeted. 
And so vacancy rates went from, you know, many of these townships from seven to eight percent to zero percent in no time at all. Yeah. Yeah. And so the no vacancy sign went out very quickly in these townships. Yeah. And, and it just sparked curiosity with me, like why has that happened? And more to the point, why did why have we not seen building in regional townships when the demand's mm. been there? Mm. And I think with this, the answer needs to be that, develop, that developers need to reduce their risks in building in regional Australia. Mm. Mm. And it's very, <coughs> very hard for them to do that because the banks uh, have black spots where they say, no, we're not going to lend to you in this area. Mm. And a lot of regional Australia mm. falls under a black spot full of reserve, full mm. the full of banks. Yes, right. So we need to do something there, whether it's a, a, a development fund set up by the government mm. to encourage supply to be built in regional Australia. Great, really good thoughts there. I think um, another one, just going back to zoning, that I would throw into the mix there is the missing middle. We talk about medium density housing as well in the burbs. Yeah. You know, and again, this is a New South Wales policy, which they tried to get with the councils and sort of said, no, we're just pushing back on it. But approval for manor housing, townhouses and low rise apartments in R2 zonings, yes. I think will free up a lot of a lot of the housing stock because you've got people in their 70s, 80s and 90s still living in four and five bedroom homes that don't use half the house. They want to move out and they want to stay in the local area, but there's nowhere to move to. Yeah. So by providing that medium density uh, housing stock of low-rise townhouses, I think, would definitely free up a lot of the housing I, I agree with you, Rich. Uh, another idea I heard as well, which I think is a, a longer-term vision for the middle ring, um, is, OK, let's build over and above our railway lines. Mm. Sounds radical. Why not? But you've got this space above the railway lines. Yep. And if you visit other countries, this is actually what happens. Great access. The space is actually utilised. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, just an idea. Love these ideas, mate. Fantastic. We'll get you to be Minister of Housing yet. So, <laughs> I just want to revisit migration just briefly and, yep. and just ask again the, the, the immigration impact we've had. As you said, we had, what, 600,000 people come in in 22, 23 yep. uh, calendar year. It was phenomenal. And mm. we obviously saw, you say, uh, vacancy rates plummet. But w what other impacts have, have that had and what's going to be the impact on the market, particularly over the next three to five years, do you think, on that? Look, I, I think with that, that burst of people coming into the country, I think it's actually been inflationary. Yeah. Uh, so the economy has got a capacity constraint. Every economy does. Mm. If you flood an economy uh, with more underlying demand all in one go, that economy will hit up against its capacity constraints. Yeah. We see it in housing, of course, through the rental market, but it's also happened in health. Mm. It's happened with education. Yeah. Uh, so the essential services, which you know, represent a big part of our economy, have definitely hit up against constraints. And so this is one of the reasons why I think migration needs to be managed. Mm. Um, you, you, if you don't manage it, then it can potentially be quite inflationary for the economy. I think it's one of the other reasons why the RBA has been struggling to get control mm. of the CPI. Interesting, yeah. So do you think, what's your prediction? I mean, do you think Labor will, if, if they maintain government next year, do you think they'll keep migration levels the same? Or do you think if Dutton gets in, he's already talking about reducing it, do you think they'll reduce it? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, it's been a political football for a long time. Mm. And the history of both major parties is it's something they don't really want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it has become more political uh, and more topical within the community in recent times because of this surge. Mm. Now, I think Labor will actually have some success in the lead up to the election in getting the migration rates down. We know it's their policy. They, they, they've got some targets which are considerably lower than the 600,000 we had over 22, 23. Mm. Mm. Uh, and I think they'll have some success with that. And I think even as we speak, we are seeing a slowdown in the rate of migration. Mm, yeah, interesting. Okay, well, this is a wait and see one. So um, I'd love you to get out your crystal ball, your boom and bust report, maybe just a little few months earlier than you may release <laughs> it in November. But tell us your, just, your predictions over the next financial year, over the next 12 months. What, what yep. do you think is going to happen in different parts of the Australia? And, and also I'd love to ask, what are the X factors that you think might be out there that could impinge on the predictions you've got. Okay, sure. So I think um, let's let's consider two time periods: uh, the period to Christmas, and then the first half of 2025. Yep. 
So for the period to Christmas, I think what we will see very shortly um, is uh, official housing price falls in Melbourne mm -hmm. and Sydney turning into a buyer's market where we'll see some housing price falls. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as mentioned before, we're not expecting a crash, but I think single digit housing price falls are somewhere between uh, minus one to about minus 5% Mm -hmm. over an annual period are likely to be reported in our two mm. largest capital cities. I say this because we're seeing leading indicators now suggesting precisely that. Yep. Yep. We're seeing it with asking prices starting to soften. Yep. We're seeing it with falling auction clearance rates as well. Yep. So for the immediate period, it is quite likely we'll record housing price falls in our two largest capital cities. Mm. I think beyond the two capital cities, so um, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, they're not showing any, sh any signs yet of a significant slowdown. Mm. Yep. Uh, we initially had um, our forecast for Brisbane, if I recall the numbers of a price rise of 2024, about circa up to 8%. And I think Brisbane's going to do more than that now. Interesting. I can probably much just on the ground, because you know I'm at the coalface and all my team across different states as well. Yeah. We are absolutely seeing exactly what you're saying. Mm. It's not a massive pullback. Buyers mm. are being very cautious at the moment. Yeah. But going to some auctions, I was at auctions <coughs> the other week in Lane Cove and uh, I kicked it off pretty low, so I managed to keep it back. But we're definitely seeing people having a harder stop at auctions. Yeah. And we're definitely seeing some price adjustments, which you never saw during the boom. It was always price adjustments upwards, not yes. downwards. Yes. So I think vendors that are out there have to be really realistic about the price. Um, it's still a competitive market, don't get me wrong. It's mm. not a complete buyer's market. It's mm. just, as you say, turning more toward a buyer's market. Mm. But tell me about next 2025, after we've turned the, the mm. Christmas corner. What so the key for 2025 will go back to the central bank. Yeah. Will we see an interest rate cut eventually? Yeah. And when will we see it? Mm. Now, if we were to see an interest rate rise, then for the first six months of 2025, the housing price falls we speak of in Sydney and Melbourne mm. will continue on yep. to the f first half of 2025 and mm. will likely spread to other capital cities. Mm. Uh, an interest rate rise would definitely mm. dent confidence further. Mm there'd be a fall in discretionary spending again, and that would translate to less buyers in the, in the housing market. Mm. That combined with the slowdown of migration would cause this, this slump in the housing market. Mm. Once again, I stress it now, it's not gonna be a crash mm. um, because of the shortage, genuine shortages we've got, but it will be a buyer's market for a 12 month period, essentially mm. starting now, we were to see that interest rate well, rise. All my clients should be very happy to hear that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually like hearing, I mean, as like we sit here, I'm thinking this spells opportunity. I mean, I've been talking to my clients a lot about mm. Melbourne mm. and uh, you might've seen the Finnery article today. It's mm. just saying, you know, Melbourne is gonna be the, you know, it's, it's very counter cyclical, but that is a great opportunity to potentially buy and, and hold for the longer term. Melbourne's so, been uh, underperforming for some years now. Mm. Uh, and big COVID hangover. Yeah. Big COVID hangover, it's some spending, yeah. adverse taxation changes yeah. as well. Mm. Mm. Um, but mm. there will be a time when uh, Melbourne does come back. Mm. I don't think it's going to be in the immediate future, though. Mm. Uh, I think right now, um, uh, Melbourne residents are focusing on the cost of living yeah. uh, and the chances that the cost of living are about to rise, especially yeah. with the risk of a, a rise in interest rates. But this is where... I try to teach my investors to take a much longer term view. I mean, you need yep. to be holding properties for seven to 10 years, right? And That's if you were true. to come into Melbourne literally in the next six months, probably at the lowest point potentially of yep. its cycle, yep. you are set for the next rise as we talk about. But you've got to have the cash to do that. So you're not, you're not going to get the high yields that you're getting in Brisbane or Perth, for example, mm -hmm. but you've got to have the ability to, to hold a, a negative. Oh, I, I agree with you. And I think in all this, um, yes, we do forecasting for housing prices, mm. but I can tell you now, timing is very difficult to get right <laughs> yeah. uh, in the market, yeah. and it is time in the market. I agree with um, time in, absolutely. Mm. That said, though, I, I think uh, over the next six months, 
um, there'll be some good opportunities yeah. for buyers mm. and the, the market is not about to suddenly take off anytime soon yeah. unless the Reserve Bank turns around and actually yeah. does an interest rate cut. Yeah, yeah. That could spark things, yeah. of course. Yeah. Do you have a, a thought in your mind of when the rate cut might come? I've got one in my head. Not, not this know. time, this, not this year anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, we were initially thinking maybe the end of this year. Mm. No. Uh, potentially the first half of 2025, yeah. potentially. Yeah. Uh, but we've got to see some better in inflationary prints. Yeah. But I think when we go into 2025, it'll be very clear, for example, um, that migration rates have slowed right down, mm. that there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy, mm. um, and uh, that will translate to slower again discretionary spending. That should bring in some more favourable prints on, the, on inflation, mm. which may will then... Um, uh, encourage the RBA to cut rates. That, as well as we need to consider what's happening globally, mm. that there's actually now some countries that have already entered into the interest rate cutting cycle. Mm. And when we see more countries enter into it, um, that will put further pressure on the RBA to join them. Yeah, got it. I'm predicting February, but here it is on the record. But again, it's going February, to depend. Okay. That's, my, that's my prediction, but I, I agree with you. I think it's going to stay on hold probably the rest of the year. I was predicting originally a November, December cut, but yeah. because it's been a bit sticky and wobbly, who knows? Next, next Wednesday, we'll find out what the inflation pre is it, and we'll see from you. But I, I reckon February next year is the first Look, cut. if the number is, is okay, <coughs> the RBA should stay on hold. Yep. If the number's bad, hmm. there'll be a heck of a lot of pressure for them to lift rates because the CPI number's been accelerating again in recent months. And that's what they said they're going to do. They not. They won't hesitate to pull the trigger. So we'll yeah. wait and see. So hmm. I want to ask you about your your previous predictions and just how accurate they've been. I mean, you you're one of the few forecasters is has the the tenacity and the ability to basically say oh, I was slightly wrong here and this happened and you've got a range of predictions. But what, how accurate have been your forecasts over the last couple of years? I've been happy with them in more recent years. Um, we had a bad year in 2018. Or mm. I was way off. We said the housing market would slow down, but mm. it fell. <laughs> um, uh, the, the 2020 year was an interesting one for us. Obviously, we didn't predict COVID. No, no um, we did predict that housing prices would rise that year, mm. and they did in the end, but I think... Mm. Uh, there were so many X factors that played out that anything could have happened that year. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were we gave ourselves an eight out of ten for our twenty three forecast. So our base yeah. case forecast came in for most cities last yeah. year, yeah. Uh, which we're we're happy about. Yeah. Um, and for this year, looks like we're going to undercook the rises in Perth mm. and undercook the rises in Brisbane. Yeah. But I'm increasingly confident we'll get it right for Sydney and Melbourne. Yep. Uh, we're confident we've got Canberra right, we're confident we've got Adelaide right, we're confident we've got Hobart right. Mm. Um, so to restate the forecast we had for Sydney and Melbourne, which we put out in November, was that we were expecting a flat to falling housing market in, in those two cities. Mm. Market started off a little bit stronger than what we anticipated, but it's coming back to our forecast now as we speak. Got it, okay, fantastic. Talk to me about listing volumes. What are you seeing in terms of trends? We, we talked about listing volumes going down over time, but yeah. in the last 12 months and next next six months, what are we seeing going forward? What are the trends in listing volumes? They've been picking up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've seen more new listings over the course of 2024 than what we've seen over the course of 23. Mm -hmm. That's been particularly the case in, uh, in the market of Sydney, uh, to a lesser extent, Melbourne as well. Um, Days on market, though, has blown out a bit more. So, yes, there's been a rise in, in listings, uh, but it hasn't always translated into more sales. Okay. And just on the back of that, delinquencies and, and yes. mortgages in arrears, are you seeing any evidence of distressed selling? And, and what are the figures for, for delinquent mortgages? Yes, you might be aware we've, we've got a distressed listings index and report mm. that we put out there um, for um, uh, our audience and... Those numbers have actually been surprisingly benign. Mm. So across the country, we're reporting about 6,000 listings which seem to be selling under distress conditions. That is out of a total number of you know, some 270,000 listings. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, so it's, it's relatively small fry in the scheme of things. Mm. We're definitely reporting less distress activity now than what we did prior to COVID. Mm. Interesting. Mm. I'm sort of seeing out there myself, I wouldn't say distress selling, but certainly there's a couple of motivated sellers, the people that have kind of maxed out mortgages and you know go you know what i'm just i can't manage the stress and, and we're seeing that and that's that's true richard i think we've seen some of that but recall about 12 months ago there was a great fear of the of the great mortgage recess yes the mortgage cliff as they call it mm. the mortgage cliff. coming off fixed rates and then didn't they, happen they, yeah mm. didn't so. happen i mean look i i think um <clears throat> there's no doubt there's been homeowners which have been under stress mm. but we must remember in this country that the principal place of residence, the home, is the last thing that sells exactly. uh, when you're trying to cut back expenditure. Mm. You mm. will stop going to restaurants first. You will stop the holidays first. You will sell a car first. You may sell the investment property first, mm. but the home is the very last thing that exactly. goes. Exactly. People hang on for, for good life. And we have full recourse mortgages, unlike in the States Correct. as well. Tell me about spring. What do you expect the, the spring season to be like in terms of market activity? Is it going to be active or subdued? What, what do you think the volume? Of I think we'll see a rise in. Well we, well, we normally get a rise in spring listings, and I think we'll see the same thing again for our largest capital cities. Clearance rates will continue to fall from here, mm. in my opinion. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, as you know, SQM Research has its own option clearance rate series. Mm. We've just been recently reporting in both Sydney and Melbourne that clearance rates have fallen below 50%. Mm. So we've got Melbourne now running up 45% and Sydney running up 48%. Mm. Historically, those type of numbers on our series have represented price declines of about 1% to 4% mm. on a per annum basis. So we're quite confident that the market will continue to slow. There will be a rise in listings and clearance rates will fall from these current levels. Mm, okay, something to watch. Love the way you track those trends. I love getting your newsletters uh, and just watching those uh, listing volumes. I, I don't think many people actually know how we put those clearance rates together, yeah. but it's actually um, a, a very strong methodology where we're very confident we're actually getting all mm. the, the records, all the, all the listings. Fantastic. We monitor it online. Mm. That's mm. how we're, we're managing to do this. Brilliant. Tell me about the rental market. What's happening with rents in each city? Are rents rising, toning down? Are vacancy rates still going to stay low for some time? What's, what's your thoughts about the trends there? Yeah, so the rental crisis is still very much with us. Uh, we have a national rental vacancy rate of 1.3%. Mm. Sydney's running at about 1.7% now, if I recall. Melbourne's running at about one5 They've actually been, um, vacancy rates have been rising in more recent months as we've gone into the winter period, which is a traditional period where you see a bit of a lull in the rental market. Mm. But we should start to see rental vacancy rates fall once again in the second half of the year as we enter into spring, mm. which is traditionally a period where there, there are more renters in the marketplace. Mm. Uh, so in terms of the rental crisis, I think it's still going to be with us for some years. Mm. Uh, we've talked about the underbuilding that we've got now. We're still going to have, despite the slowdown of migration, a fairly strong population growth rate overall. Um, but one thing that I think will change, and I think is changing as we speak, is that a lot of the negative news for tenants has been now being priced into the rental market. Mm. So the days of 10 to 20% rises in rents, I think are now behind us. Mm. And it's starting to show up in our numbers now. Mm. We're actually recording some rent declines in Sydney, mm. for example. From their, very, from their very high levels. Right. Um, and it's the case now in Melbourne too. Uh, so I talk about uh, being priced in. Mm. So you can have um, a shortage in the rental market, yet rents are, have essentially stabilised mm. because all that bad news has been priced in, in the years prior. The other thing, like in Queensland, they've just introduced new laws that <coughs> even if they tenant is on a, on a leaves their, uh, their rental property, it's still yeah. on, a, on a 12 month period, but you can't put up rents more than once <coughs> within a 12 month period. So there's gonna be some lag effect too for when landlords can actually increase rents in, in that state. There, there, there is some lag there, um, mm. yeah, I agree. Mm. But I'm, I must say that I'm uh, not a proponent of rental restrictions in the market, caps on no. rents, Anything like that, this is crazy. It's actually counterproductive. Exactly, it's gonna yeah, force them up longer. I have one last very big question for you, Louis, and that is, when do you think the next big property boom is coming? 
and what will be the main drivers of supply and demand <laughs> to drive that? Because I remember one years ago, you used this great expression, we're going to have the mother of all property booms. I can't remember what year it was. I thought it was a cracking comment. <laughs> but do you, do you have a, a, any kind of predictions or thoughts on where we're going to see a significant boom in, in the next decade? Mm. Like, is this, is this undersupply that we talked about earlier, is that going to come to fruition in five years? Is there... You know, if migration gets turned down and gets turned up again, if, if builders don't, you know, get the DA approved and they just can't afford to build them, are we still going to have this problem? What, what do you think? Risha, I'm not so sure whether we're going to get a, a mother of all property booms nationwide, not unless the Reserve Bank of Australia um, aggressively cuts rates yeah. back towards, say, 1%. Yeah. And I think that's highly unlikely, unlikely. for the time being. Yeah. Mm. But could we see a situation where you have certain cities continue to outperform mm. in, say, the high single digits over the next five years? Well, I think so. I think Brisbane's going to be one of those cities where mm. we're going to see long-term outperformance compared to Sydney and Melbourne. And Perth is another one as well, though I think there are probably a little bit... There's some more risks over Perth. Uh, we know, of course, the Perth housing market has been tied to the overall global commodities market. That's it. Mm. That said, though... One big change which has occurred with the state of WA is that um, they have, for the last three to four years now, I think, been receiving a larger percentage of the GST pie. And that has been helping the state tremendously. Mm. And it's still with the state of WA as we speak. Mm. Uh, so I have more confidence, despite the falls in iron ore prices we're now seeing, that the the state of WA's housing market is likely to continue to outperform. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So they, these are the two cities in particular. I think affordability, relative affordability is a Adelaide? big factor. Adelaide can do well, but it, I always scratch my head in terms of its outperformance mm. because you look, look at the South Australian economy, you know, there's not a lot of fireworks there. Mm. You know, quite frankly, yeah. there just isn't. Mm -hmm. But one thing that South Australia does have, and the city of Adelaide definitely has in spades, mm. is affordability. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think uh, people are moving to South Australia mm. to pick up on that affordability factor. People need to also be cautious, though, that it could be more difficult to find a job in Adelaide mm. when we have a, a major economic slowdown. Got it. Mm. Fantastic. Well, Louis, thank you for, that's all my questions, but thank you so much for your insights today. It's been fascinating. You've helped solve the housing crisis. You've given <laughs> some great predictions. You've given some really good intel. Oh, no, I'm, I'm glad to help out, uh, Rich, and hopefully your audience has found some value in it. Yeah, thanks again, Louis. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, once again, for joining us on the Property Buyer Podcast. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Bye for now. Thanks for being with us on another Property Buyer Podcast. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please click on the SpeakPipe link and we'll answer this during the next episode. If you're looking to buy a residential or commercial property in the near future and would like to get the added advantage of having a buyer's advocate on your side, then please reach out to my team today and send us your inquiry and we'd be delighted to help. Please visit our website at propertybuyer.com.au where you can stay updated with all my latest market updates weekly blogs and live suburb profiles to help you make better property decisions. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next Property Buyer Podcast.